We welcome all of you tonight. Those that have joined us on live stream also. It's good for us to dwell together in unity. Amen. <laughs> Tonight will be our 72nd lesson in the your exposition of Genesis. We're going to be begin the 45th chapter, the first 15 verses, Joseph is going to reveal himself to his brothers. <clears throat> then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, cause every man to go out from me, and there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. I am Joseph, doth, thou, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved or angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye! And go up to my father, and say to him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine lest thou and thy house and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes shall see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto thee. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen. And ye shall haste, and bring down my father thither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. Amen. Well, a, a tender scene indeed. And accounts like this are in the scripture to help and guard us against a hard and calloused view of things. We live in a time when it's easy to develop a hard heart. You're not touched by anything, you're just calloused. And These tender scenes are in the scripture that help us to break loose from that. <coughs> now we're seeing this account, and I want to make a few comments about it because we're being exposed to God and and to people that have been exposed to God and how they react. In particular, I want to focus on Joseph knowing what to do. Uh, this is a kind of a strange thing in our society. There are whole social stations in life that are designed to help people that don't know what to do. Yeah. It's like, it's like a plague. We, we like to live in times of tremendous ignorance, mm -hmm. even about the things of the earth. Yeah. They don't know what to do, but Joseph 
always knew what to do. And I wanted to comment on this. You're faced with a man who knew what to do. He was able to receive a word from God and then reason upon it, think upon it, and then it shaped his thinking, how he thought. We have no example of Joseph being given special directions like the one we're reading about or like interpreting the dream or, or what to do about the famine. We have no text that tells us he was told that directly. In the matter of interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, he simply said, it's not in me. God shall give Pharaoh the answer in peace. And then he just did, then he just did it. it. Looked like it was on the fly. Appears as though it took place when the dream was reported. He just, just knew what it was. The manner in which Pharaoh should respond to the famine of plenty, that he knew right away what to tell him, but there's no record that he received a special revelation from God on that. How to distribute the surplus is no record, but he knew, he knew what to do. He knew how to do this. And how to respond to his brothers during their first trips. He had this kind of test, but we don't have a record where he, got a, he had a dream or a vision or something telling him what to do. How to respond to his brothers the second trip. He did the same thing. And now, of course, I, I don't want to carry this too far. But instantly knowing what to say with direction coming through immediate thoughts and assessments, that is a reality. God can give you what to say on the fly. When, yeah. when you face the thing, it just, just comes to you. Amen. Of course, you have to be sensitive to God and close to God. Yeah. Now, Jesus told his disciples, he, he, he brought this up. This ability that God gives his people that you can't put it in a book. <laughs> you couldn't tell someone else how to do this. He said to them, when they deliver you up, take no thought how. Take no thought how or what you shall speak. It shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak. See, it's, it's hard on the, you're, you're, the, you're, you're living under God. You're serving God. As you do this, it it comes to you. That's what he that's what he told. That's what he instructed him. Don't you go home now and, and study this all out and have a little notepad with all the different responses you'll be able to give. Now it takes this takes faith. I understand this yeah. takes faith, but there does need to be more of this. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying that you should never think, and you know, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there are times when you don't have time mm -hmm. to think the thing through. But God can direct your thoughts on, on an instant type basis. Knowing how to handle the word correctly. A person has to strive to be able to do this, to know how to handle it. That you can respond to things or you can give directions. Or you can use the appropriate scripture at the right time. That's what Paul said meant when he said to Timothy. Now study or give diligence, we'd say, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing here means dis distribution. Knowing to give the right thing at the right time. Some other versions say handling correctly the word of truth. Someone asked you about grace, you don't quote a scripture on works. <laughs> but it's amazing how I many people do this. It's almost like it's a that talks about faith, someone s cites a scripture on yeah, but, and they add something else. Knowing how to handle yeah. word of truth accurately. The New, New International Version says, and handles, and correctly handles the word of truth. The New Revised Standard says, rightly explaining the word of truth. Basic Bible English says, giving the true word in the right way. Got to see what this is saying. This is... This has been skipped over. Yeah. Most of the time people quote 2 Timothy 2.15, they mean study your Bible a lot, then you'll know what to say. Yeah. The Jewish Bible says interprets the message of the truth correctly. Holman Standard Bible says correctly teaching the word of truth. The Living Bible says know what his word says it means. 
International Standard Version says, handling the word of truth with precision. Amplified Bible says, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. It's amazing text of scripture. This is part of the steps of a good man being ordered by the Lord. This, this is part of this. It's just, this all postulates or is based upon the fact that you're walking by faith, living in the, you're yeah. walking in the spirit, living by faith, you're walking in fellowship with God, your mind isn't engaged in other things, your affections are set on things above, and then all this happens. But if that isn't what's going on, this will not happen. Yeah. And that's why people are stumped. They're stumped by life. <coughs> they don't know what to do. And sometimes... I've faced situations like this personally. Paul did when he didn't know what to do, despaired of life. But he, but finally in the midst of all that, it was made known to him. See, So what you do, you hold on. You hold on to what you do know by faith, and the Lord will direct your steps. That Directing your steps, that involves assessment, being able to look at a thing and, and judge it correctly thinking and applying and proper communication. Just as Abraham, he was directed as he traveled. See? As he traveled. Amen. Yeah. He said, now you leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to a land and I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you the land. But you have, to get on the, you have to get on the road before I show you. Yeah. Or offer Isaac on a mountain, I'll show, I'll show you. You said you set out, head toward Moriah, and you, you set out and then on the way, I'll show you. Now that's something involved involving what Solomon said, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. That's, that's something what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Now I know a lot of people don't know this, so they hesitate to live for God because they're not sure whether they can or not. They're not sure whether it's worth it or not. But you've got to launch out and do it. Yeah. And live your life wholly for the Lord. He's the only one you ultimately want to please. If if so, if you got to to please somebody else, you have to displease God. You just obstinately refuse to do it. You doesn't make any difference who it is. You you refuse to do it, and then what'll happen? God will direct your steps. He'll show you what to do. Whether you ought to call for a basket and be led over the wall or whether you ought to appeal to Caesar, or whether you should stand still and present your case. See, he'll, he'll tell you what to do, show you. Yeah. God has access to our minds. Yes. He does. And Joseph is a classic example of this. He can teach believers to love one another. Now, you've got to have access to their heart and mind to do that, I would think. He can illuminate the mind, the eyes of your understanding can be enlightened. And... It can be done on the fly. Now, I'm not saying you should depend on this all the time and just be a intellectual sloth. That's not what I'm saying. There's, I'm saying there are some things you don't know are going to happen. You've got to live with this in mind that when they do happen, the Lord will direct your steps. You'll have a sense of what to say, just like Joseph did. And it all happens, so to speak, on the fly. Really they, some, you, you'll be able to actually see this has happened to you if you just reassess, trace your path back a, yeah. a little bit as far, as far as you can go, and, and you'll find out, you'll see places where this actually happened to you. You All of a sudden, it just came to you what you should do. What was that? It wasn't like the light bulb certainly turned on. It was That was God directing, yeah. directing you. Yeah. So you can know how to answer every man yes. with this in mind, see? No, yes, yeah, Sister Barb. There are opportunities very, very, very often that won't last for mm -hmm. a person to go home and study the thing out. Uh -huh. That's right. The opportunity is there at the present, and so we must enter into that to make it effectual. That's right. Yeah. This is, I see it, this is part of our uh, our job as believers and part of the pillar and ground of the truth is to convince people, uh -huh. Christian people, to convince them of this so they can live unto God confidently, yeah. knowing that there are things you have to think out, 
there are times when you don't have time to think it out, as Sister Barbara said. But God's not handicapped by that at all. You can know how to give an answer to every man that asks the reason for the hope that's in you. You don't ponder out what are the possible questions that I'll be asked. You put them on a notebook. You don't know what or how. What will prompt a person to ask you about your hope? Of course, it's obvious you're living for Christ or that nobody would ask. That's, that's why people aren't asked today. Yeah, that's right. yeah. They aren't living by hope. Or they may say, well, I'm a Christian. I love God. This is just a lot of talk, mm -hmm. cheap talk. This isn't the truth. Mm -hmm. There's such a stark difference between a person who's born of God and one who's not that the one who's not wants to know about it. At least someone from that camp wants to know about it. But if a person's not really living for God, if he's just trying, they won't ask. Yeah, you know, all this presumes it, that the walk is there. It presumes also that when you live by faith, there's no inhibiting obstacle or influence you will face that you can't deal with, or maybe God will say, run out of the room. Huh? Like he had Joseph. Maybe that maybe that's the answer. Turn your back and run. That's what it was for Joseph that time with Potiphar's wife. Now I'm suggesting Joseph was the kind of man that could be directed. He was a directable person. God can put God can move a person to do something by putting something in his heart. So Ezra wrote, Blessed be the God, Lord God of our fathers, who, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the temple. God put that, put that in his heart. That was Cyrus. He put it in, put it in his heart. <laughs> God is still God. He can still do. They can put things in people's hearts. And that's what we're seeing in Joseph's, Joseph's case. Now those who compromise their lives by unnecessary involvements have no idea of the impact those involvements have on them. <coughs> you will soon find out if you're serious about God that when he said, come ye out from among them, that is exactly what he means. And the them you come out from are the ones that are bottlenecked, that cause, put you in a bottleneck spiritually. They hinder you. They hold you back. You say, but I want to win them to Christ. That isn't that. That isn't your job. You will only be, able, only be able to influence people that are attracted to you. And if living for God doesn't attract them, they can't be attracted. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I mean, that's how you have to, have to think. <laughs> but some people's lives are so filled with trivia that they're, they're not directable. God can't show them these things as they travel along because they're too, they're too tied up with other things. Now, you can't pass laws on this, I know, and I would not ever attempt to legislate to a person how they ought to live, but I will legislate to my body how, how it lives. Mm -hmm. yes. I will choose who I'm going to be around most of the time, mm -hmm. and I'm around on... on acceptable people uh, largely unwillingly. If something in life brings me in their contact, I'm going to have my armor on, full armor. People who don't live for God, they stumble through life. They make a mistake here, and they make a mistake there, and they make a blunder here, and they make a blunder there. And the reason they do is they're not directable. See, God can't direct their steps because they're not on the highway. For the Lord to direct your steps, you have to be on the way of holiness. You have yeah. to be on the highway. Yeah. And if you are, yeah. you'll experience to a greater degree than Joseph did because yes. your, your involvement with the Lord is closer than Joseph's was. Yes? In, in situations which we do find ourselves um, <clears throat> being in the midst of people who are ungodly, though we would not choose their company, my prayer has become, Lord, when I'm around people that 
do not love you, let Christ in me be the dominating influence. And that's good. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in the life of Joseph. That's right. <coughs> Here he was in a heathen nation, and yet God was the, the dominating influence through him. That's right. Mm -hmm. One man, out, you know, in a sense, outnumbered all these others. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you see, <laughs> I said this over many years ago, but I just thought of it. If you're surrounded, if we're surrounded by the enemy, shout to one another, don't let any of them get away. <laughs> well, eventually Joseph was put in a place of political power. That's yeah. right. Where he could dictate. That's where he exactly did have right. control. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Life and death control. See, but if he hadn't have been sensitive yeah. and directable, this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And when you consider how relatively little, how comparatively little he knew compared to what we know, he is a sterling example that a hearty effort toward the Lord will be honored. Amen. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's an example of that. Being, uh, we're talking about being directed inwardly, not by outward signs. And there, some of those may occur. I don't, I don't question that, but we're talking most of the inward ones. The Lord will direct their path. He'll do it within. <coughs> Psalm 25, 9 says he'll guide them in judgment. They'll know how to assess, and how to think. His acquaintance with the Lord who teaches men in the way he should go. He'll lead you the way he should go. God will show that. He'll guide them with his eye. See? Isaiah wrote of this guidance in this way. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. Yeah. See, there's no reason for anybody to go astray that's in Christ. That's right. Amen. There's no reason, no legitimate reason, no legitimate reason for anyone in Christ to go astray. This is true. He'll do it. Sometimes it just comes from a, from a sense. Uh, yeah. Some people might call it a feeling, but it's, a, it's a deeper than a surface feeling. Yeah. It's, it's a profound, it's a conviction, more like a conviction or a persuasion. So we do well to ponder these things. Now our text uh, opens up. Joseph is, has them all before him. And he could not refrain himself before them. <coughs> couldn't restrain himself or couldn't control himself or, was unable to keep back his feelings, no longer control his feelings, couldn't no longer keep this com his, keep his composure. He could no longer control his emotions. He could stand it no longer. There's just come a time when it just his emotions just like erupted and spilled out. There here there were twenty two years of time packed into a single moment. And he just, the emotions were too strong for this body, but he just boom, burst forth. A tender moment indeed. No one else standing by knew all the circumstances involved. See, he's processing a lot of yeah. things in his mind. He sees the hand of God in this sees all the sorrow and the havoc that's been wrought because of this, sees all the harm, all the tests, and just, just erupted. Just, he couldn't keep it back anymore. There are occasions of when you had to put everybody out. Yeah. He put everybody, everybody out, everybody except my brothers out of the room. He didn't want to be out of control in their presence. See, mm -hmm. out of the room before he burst out weeping. Get rid of the get rid of the strangers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Get rid of the strangers before I start weeping, so you don't get the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. I've experienced things like this myself. When I've asked the Lord to help me to restrain my emotions, I'm alone. Mm -hmm. He was faithful to do it. You can do this. If you have these strong, pent-up feelings, you, 
You can withhold them while the people that don't understand it are there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people just don't think you're an emotional wreck, you know. Quite a picture. He had a, he had a lot of control, but not total. Mm. Not total control. Cause every man to see. There were some things Jesus did that other people just just a few people got to see it. Yeah, yeah, right. Went in to raise Jairus' his daughter. He put everybody out by Peter, James, and John. That's all. And the parents. That's all. When he ate the Passover, he just his disciples. That's all. When he raised from the dead, just certain people. So when he's transfigured, just three saw it. See, there's still certain occasions that were limited. Yeah. Now, we would like uh, every gathering to be a mount of transfiguration. We would like this. Mm -hmm. We certainly would not object that they are, but it's highly unlikely that they will be. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But that's, that's what we target. We want to live close enough to God that we're among the ones he invites in <laughs> to see the further revelation. When he prays, he takes three with him a little further. He takes all 12. He takes all 11 with him into the garden. But when he, went, when he really got down to really got down to wrestling with this, he just took three a little further. You want to be one of those. Amen. Amen. I can go a little further. So during the normal course of life, there are times when words are directed to certain people and they're not intended for anybody else. I know when Jesus said, there were two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But he's not there as a spectator. That's not what he's there as. He's there as a, as a teacher and a comforter and exhorter and revealer. He'll speak through various people. If a stranger comes in, he already, so that stranger will be spoken to, but in a sense, that was an interruption. The process of edification is put on pause till that guy was dealt with. So that was not a circumstance that was intended to happen every time they came together. But there are people that want, they want to fill up the congregation with people that they want to convert. Amen. This isn't the place. Yeah. People got to see that now. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it's not right, but this is this is the way it is. There's, if you want the deep things of God, you can't be surrounded by a bunch of sinners. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. This is how it's given. So you put them all out. Because mm -hmm. it's a private, fam this family matter, private. Mm -hmm. No man stood with him. While Joseph made himself known to his brethren. Now we know something of the uh, impact of this occasion on Joseph. But I thought about what it must have had on his brothers. Yeah. <laughs> kind of impact it must have had upon them. Yeah. Now it says he wept aloud or out loud. Very loudly. He raised his voice in weeping. Now this is, this is the manner of the Eastern world. It's not the manner of the Western world. It's been intellectualized, and this isn't the manner of the Western world. This is my opinion, but I'm of the opinion that pent-up feelings are not good. There's some people that should be crying out loud because of their sin. Not just talking about it or casually thinking about it. Some people have been blessed so much they should, it should be an out loud type expression. The words here indicate that his tears were mingled with words. And he cried, wept so loudly that the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. Now the idea here and some of the other versions project this, is that those that he just sent out of the room, they heard him, and then it was reported, heard here in Pharaoh's house, or it doesn't mean Pharaoh heard him over at his house. It means the word got. Why? Because they were not accustomed to seeing Joseph weep. Hmm. 
and he had a lot of things to weep about. But they strangers didn't see Joseph weep. If he had tears, they didn't see no one saw Paul weep unless it was the brethren. But he said, met tears. He told Timothy, I'm mindful of your tears. But they they didn't put it on display. I, I, you can work with that however you feel best, but <laughs> It seems safe to assume that although Joseph's weeping was heard, the word that follows was only heard by his brothers. They heard him weeping, but they didn't hear what his disclosure. <coughs> what advantage would it be for them to hear? Why should the Egyptians hear what Joseph's brothers did to him? What advantage would that be? <coughs> the part of human frailty is attended by the entrance of sin into the world that has tended sin's interest into the world is the inability for men to thoroughly and consistently control their inward emotions and responses. There comes a time when you just can't do it. These should be infrequent times. I've experienced this. I just, I just couldn't hold it back. Just erupted in tears and expressions, sometimes of sorrow, sometimes of joy, but... That inability to control is part of what sin brought in, that that faculty. Yes. That you sense here that Joseph didn't let the injustice that he had faced early in life consume his life. That's right. So that every Egyptian on every street knew exactly That's what, right. yes. what had happened to Joseph. We yes. know that he didn't because when he faced particular hardships, you know, like being sold into, into, into the house of Potiphar, he was faithful there. When he was put down into the prison, he was faithful there. So he kept his wits about him That's and right. continued to be faithful in the face of continuing hardship that That's he faced. Right. That's yeah. very commendable, and that is not very easy to do. No. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's, it's, this is not common. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, there are situations in life where we have, as Scripture says, sorrow upon sorrow. Mm -hmm. Sometimes trouble and sorrow comes like in waves. Now, how a person responds to it, that you want to do so in a comely manner. You want to be with the, when you have sorrow upon sorrow, instead of staying home, you want to be with the brethren as much Amen. as possible. Because right. real, real people are going to understand and be able to come alongside and help you to yeah. bear up under it. But if you stay home and just handle it yourself, well, maybe you've done it and you know already what will happen. And here's something else to learn, that men can't be trained to control their emotions. <laughs> There's not a course on, you know, count to ten and so forth. There's, there are people who do, do say things like this, count to ten and, and then quote these first, quote all of the attitudes. But that this, uh, if you've ever been under a system like that, you know that this is well nigh impossible to do. <laughs> so you can't train someone. You can only teach them to trust in God. Maintain your wits about you when you're in the public. If you're fasting, don't go out and do it with your face disfigured and say, oh, no, I can't eat again today. I'm on this long fast. Wash your face, anoint your head so nobody knows you're fasting. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. That involves some control. Yeah. <coughs> and Joseph said to his brethren, I'm Joseph. Does my, brother yet, does my father yet live? <laughs> His brethren are dumbfounded. They, they hit them like a pile of rocks. They, they, were, they couldn't answer. Joseph had already asked him, is your, is, is your father alive? Remember he asked him, chapter 43, verse 7, is your father alive? But that's not what he asked this time. He says, is my father alive? Yeah. <laughs> Remember that Joseph was favored of his father. This confirms Joseph had reciprocated by loving his father. Yeah. See, there are a lot of children that have been favored uh -huh. that are, quite frankly, lousy children. Yeah. Joseph wasn't. Mm -hmm. He returned. Amen. He returned. He reciprocated with his love to his father. 22 years since he was home, my father, he's still concerned about his, his father. 
I, you might ask the question, why didn't Joseph contact his father? He, uh, he'd been on the throne now for two years, uh, nine years, uh -huh. seven years of plenty and two years of famine. Uh -huh. Why did, didn't he, that when he could, why couldn't, didn't he send out there and find out about his father? Why did he contact him? And as is true with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph had remained to determined to remain where God put him until God told him to move. That was true of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Whenever God, whenever God told them to move, they moved and they stayed where they were until God said, "Move again." So he, that's what he did. He was serving a purpose that could not be carried out in Canaan. Yeah, he knew this. If I'm ahead of distributing the grain, I can't do that in Canaan. This would require, this would involve and require a favorable reception by Pharaoh. Then he's going to tell him to come here. <coughs> well, they wouldn't get this if he went there and left his job and handed it over to somebody else. <coughs> So he was staying there so the will of God would be fulfilled. He had been told to move. And that's why he hadn't, to this state, contacted Jacob. This, this isn't what God wanted done. It was pre, this was uh, too early. Well, his brethren couldn't answer him. They were troubled. That word, as used here, means disturbed, alarmed, terrified, anxious, afraid. Nervous, dismayed, terrified, trembling, agitated. They, they didn't know Joseph. Well, they didn't know what had happened to Joseph. After they sold him, they didn't know. For 22 years, they didn't know. That's about how long we've been. Next year, we will be here for 22 years. It would be like we never had any kind of contact to anybody in Indiana for 22 years. See? Then all of a sudden, I show up. And people thought I died. See, so because you can only imagine what the, how these brothers were at this state. Now that they knew they were confronting Joseph, a flood of feelings converged on their souls. Feelings like fear, dismay, agitation, astonishment, consternation. What's he going to do? Mm -hmm. Is he going to retaliate? Mm -hmm. This is what we did. We were, we were retaliatory. Yeah. He's our brother. Maybe he's retaliatory too. Mm -hmm. He's going to take it out now. He's going to take it out on us. See, you can only imagine what they'd be thinking. So Joseph, they didn't catch it when he said first. I am Joseph. Yeah. They, they missed it. So he says, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph. And then he asked, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Yes, so nobody else knew that. Ah, nobody else knew that. This, so this is the real Joseph. He must have looked a little bit different. Because he's a grown man now, and he's arrayed in royal apparel and so forth. You might say he'd, uh, he'd been glorified, you might say. <clears throat> come near. This revelation is not something he'll do at a distance. Just say, stay there, and I'll, I'll shout out to you and tell you who I am. And No, he had to come near. Yeah. Now, this is God's way. This is how God operates. We're seeing, a, we're seeing in God's man how God operates. Mm -hmm. God still speaks and ministers most effectively to people when they're close to him. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many people expect God to talk to them, direct them, and so forth when they're living way out there on the edge. Yeah. Would they expect some kind of supernatural direction? I wouldn't say it can't happen, but I would say it's not likely to happen. The law made nothing perfect, we're told, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh. What do you draw nigh for? To get something, to hear something, to receive direction, to perceive something. That's why you're drawing near. Because there are things that happen when you're near that you just don't experience when you're far. You can say when the eyes of your understanding are enlightened and you suddenly 
You can say, that's your sign that you're near. See? If you wonder, am I near? That's your sign. That you're near. Draw near to God. James said, draw near to God. And, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you double-minded. Hebrews 10, 22 says, let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. See, it's all lived out. Joseph, this is all being lived out. In salvation, God initially places us closer yes. than you were before. Yes. He puts you in Christ. Mm -hmm. You're closer than you were before. Yeah. And, and you now have an ability to be directed. Yeah. Amen. God can work with you now. Yes. Can teach you now. Lead you now. A lot of, actually, Scripture says, they that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid of thy tokens. When you're living far off from God, everything scares you. Yeah. <laughs> Been having a conversation with one, one brother that used to be among those that are always worried about a conspiracy happening. And there's uh, this stuff is going on all the time now. They are, the enemy's going to do this, and the government's going to do that. And, That's because they're not near. Yeah. They're afraid because they're not near. Uh -huh. right. They're dwelling in the uttermost parts. Yeah. A lot of theological confusion are the direct result of being at an unwarranted distance from the Lord. That's, yeah. that's why all those questions and doubts and fears arise. In fact, some questions simply can't be satisfactorily addressed from a distance. You may try and do it. Maybe you've tried to do it. You talked to someone at a distance and you tried to explain to them what was going on. They couldn't, yeah. they couldn't get it. It was kind of a marvel. So simple, seems so simple to you. Why, why can't they see that? Because they're at a distance. Yes, amen. They're at a distance and God's arranged things so you just can't get this stuff at a distance. Yeah. Okay. Why not? Because people would stay there if they could. Yeah. Right. Until those who are in the name of Christ draw near to him, and maintain that closeness, there are essential things that they will not see. And we may be displeased with it, wish it didn't exist, but that's just the way things are. It's because there's so much non-essential stuff in their life. They've just got too much stuff in their life. There's a kind of Christianity in our day that's being promoted that actually fosters aloofness from God. It actually promotes aloofness from God. It offers uh, camaraderie in the flesh, you know, pleasure trips, scenic trips, things like this. They offer substitutes for the peace and the joy that God gives. And the serious, this is very, very serious, but few people think it really is. When a person is in these far off places, they've left their first love. Uh -huh. yes. This is what's happened. Amen. So their attachment to Christ is not an affectionate association. It's not one that's touched their feelings and their emotions and their desires and their aspirations. It, it has it reached that deep, and so they'll just flounder around without any direction. So Joseph, he gets them near, he says, I am Joseph, your brother, it's me. <laughs> it's hard to recognize him after 22 yeah. years, so he wasn't a boy anymore. Yeah. Note that he doesn't say, I am Joseph. He says, I am Joseph, your brother. First time he just said, I'm Joseph. They said, Your brother, remember me? It's like a, like a dagger. <laughs> this proved to be like a barb in their conscience. Oh. They've been trying to forget Joseph. For 22 years, they've been trying to forget him. I imagine Jacob, I imagine Jacob probably mentioned him quite frequently. I remember Joseph. Those, those days when Joseph was here. Now they hear him, now that they're closer, they not only hear his words, 
but they see his countenance and they feel the impact yeah. of his presence. Now, as I mentioned, there is a, currently an approach to Christianity that fails to confront people with the presence, words, and works of Jesus. Yeah. They just kind of hold back on it. Uh -huh. They're not ready for that yet, you know. I want to, first of all, let me, let's get down to their problems and get close to them, become friends. And mm -hmm. They don't confront people with the Christ. And so they have become accustomed to living in the world and unaccustomed to being in the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're dealing with people that aren't Christians, you, this issue has to be pressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. It has to be pressed. Yeah. And Paul had a chance to speak to a king. He didn't talk to him about civil, the state of civil affairs. Mm -hmm. He preached to him about Christ, told him, gave him his testimony. He said, I know you know these things, Agrippa. Then Felix said, well, you almost, you almost, uh, or Agrippa said, almost you persuade me. Almost, I would to God you were all together persuaded. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you were like me, except for these chains. He pressed, That's right. he pressed the issue. Uh -huh. Now, people that have difficulty separating from carnal influences, this is why. Yeah. They don't press this issue. That's right. mm -hmm. No, if you want me as your friend, you're going to have to get used to me talking about my Lord yeah. and mention to you what Christ did for yeah. you. Yeah. And if you said you don't want to hear this, we can't be friends. Yeah, that's, right. See, that's the way it is. <laughs> you have to work that out now yourself. We want to promote closeness. Then he adds that uh, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Boy, <laughs> whom you sold. In, boy, I can imagine the thoughts that caused to come up. You sold into Egypt. Now, I want to deal with this somewhat. Actually, they didn't sell them into Egypt. If that, they think, technically speaking, they sold them to the Ishmaelites. And, and like Pilate, they uh -huh. lost their hands. There's a principle, a man of the kingdom. The person who starts the process gets credit for the whole process. That's what I want to establish here. <clears throat> yeah, it's in this chart here. His brothers sold to the Ishmaelites. That's all they personally did. Then he was sold into Egypt to Potiphar. In between, he was, he was sold, he was given to the Midianites, then to Potiphar, but his brothers got credit for the whole thing. See that? Now, it's quite a parallel with the Jews and Jesus, crucifying Jesus. The Jews delivered up Jesus, they, and then he was given to the soldiers, came and arrested him, then he went to Caiaphas, and Caiaphas sent him to Pilate, Pilate sent him to Herod, and Herod sent him back to Pilate, and Pilate delivered him to be crucified, but the Jews got the credit yeah, for the right. whole thing. Yeah, right. hmm? mm -hmm. How about that? Yeah. Judas betrayed him. The soldiers and the chief priests and elders arrested him. He is delivered to and tried by Caiaphas, delivered to Pilate. Pilate sent him to Herod, who mocked him. Herod delivered him back to Pilate, and who had him scourged, Pilate delivered him to the soldiers to be crucified. Yet the Jews responsible for the whole thing. Yeah. Now there was a sense in which all of them conspired. They, all of them gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. He said the rulers, the people of the Jews, Pontius Pilate and Herod, they all formed a coalition against Jesus. But when the preaching came to the preaching, that was the insight that the early believers had this insight mm -hmm. that this was a conspiracy fostered by the devil in which several people, when the, it came to responsibility mm. for Jesus being delivered up to be crucified, when it came to responsibility, the Jews shouldered it because yeah. they started it. Uh -huh. And of course, there's several uh, texts that actually say this. Him being delivered up by the determinate counsel of foreign lovers of God, you have taken and crucified. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified. 
But you denied the just one and killed the prince of life. You slew and hanged him on a tree. The Jews both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. The Jews slew him and hanged him on a tree. See, so this, see, sin increases. Once sin starts, it increases. But the person who started it gets the credit for the increase too. Well, you see it in Adam. The first sin is a classic example of this. During his trial, the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Say, so, well, they didn't mean to do it. They just, well, from, from this perspective, they did mean to do it, or they would have said, no, we're not going to do it. See, but they did it. And go. Yes, right. And well, they pressed and threatened him, yeah, politically right. pressured him. You let him go, we'll turn you into your boss. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you can see this this principle, can you not? His brothers started this thing rolling. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife went to prison, when he went to prison, but his brothers got credit for all of that. The sin just says, when you commit the sin, it just doesn't die with you. Yeah. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Pretty soon it spreads. That's why the church cannot countenance sin yes. in its, in the, within the body. Yeah. Known sin. Because it, it'll spread. It, it's defiling. Uh-huh. It's the nature of sin. Uh-huh. Jimmy? Yes. So this whole thing was by the determinate counsel of God. That's right. Yeah. They still got the credit for it because they were ignoble vessels. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Yeah, 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 Peter told them they were fulfilling the determinate counsel, but you, you did it. That's right. Yeah. The disciples didn't do it. They were Jews. They didn't do it. That's right. Yeah. Huh? Mm-hmm. See, they, they, mm-hmm. those that live close to God, he'll protect them from this. Yeah. And he did this like he did the disciples. Now we have this again, another example of sin spreading in, in uh, Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And of that sort of thing, he says that their words will increase unto more ungodliness. Uh-huh. So false doctrine, no matter how innocent it may appear, breeds sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. Now we've been talking, we've been ministering on Lord's evening on the second coming of Christ, which is so garbled today, hardly anyone knows at all what it's all about. But that doctrine that teaches people that Jesus is going to come and set up his kingdom on earth and so forth has bred Sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. And that's part of the reason why the church is in the shape it's in. Yes. Because it's heard things that aren't true. Uh-huh. And if you, maybe you think you should foster friendship and put up with it. No, you shouldn't. That's right. Because then you'll be responsible. Yes. Amen. You say, well, I don't think that's right. Come out of her, my people. Uh-huh. Talking to Babylon here in Revelation 18. Come out of her, my people, that you... Be not partaker of her place. Yes, so if you insist on remaining associated with someone that is delivering things that aren't true, when they come down, you'll come down too. Yeah. That's just the way. That's, right. That's the way it is. <laughs> well, knowing the truth, Joseph now rises to a high. He says, "Now, uh, don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves." That you sold me hither. He means, when he says, don't be grieved and don't be angry, he doesn't mean to be happy about it. That isn't what he means. He means, don't be overcome uh-huh. by this. Don't let your sorrow and grief keep from you what, mm. what, what, what's been opened up. Mm. It's possible to grieve over your sins so bad you go out and hang yourself. Uh-huh. Yeah. Huh? That's what oh, Judas right. did, right? That's what Judas did. He was grieved, he was sorrowful, he repented, him. he repented himself. God didn't give him repentance. He repented himself, yeah. went out and hung himself. So that's, he's saying, don't, if you think about this from the standpoint of flesh, I mean, you may try and take your life. It's such a bad thing. Yeah. So don't, 
Don't dwell on this. I'm going I'm to give you a higher view of this yeah. you for you to dwell upon. See, when, you, when it comes to you, that your sin was responsible for Christ's death, it could overcome you if you didn't see God in the thing. Amen. It would overcome you. So don't, don't be grieved about it. God, God sent me here before you. Now, to my knowledge, there's no specific revelation that says God revealed this to him. I'm thinking that Joseph, being guided by the Lord, put this all together. Because there was no way to account for his elevation outside of God. He, yeah. he knew uh -huh. this is the Lord's doing. Yeah. And the famines in Canaan, I found out about that. So he, mm. he must have put this thing together yeah. himself. God sanctified his mind. See, a sanctified mind can put things together yeah. yes. and make sense out of it. You've experienced this, haven't you? You've experienced this yourself. Mm. The marvelous truth. God has sent me before you. Now, let's think about now what God did. God sent me before you. God sent seven years of plenty of service. God sent a famine that consumed the land. God prepared Joseph to be instrumental in resolving it. God revealed to Pharaoh in two dreams what he was going to do. God had Joseph exalted to be a ruler. And all this was according to God's will, which he was works among the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah. Why did he do it? To preserve life. <coughs> <coughs> well, you might say, well, why'd he go through all of that to preserve life? Why couldn't he just have made the corn grow in, in Canaan? Wouldn't that have done the same thing, that their crops would have grown? No, I wouldn't have done the same thing because God promised Abraham they were going to go down into a strange land and they were going to be oppressed there for 400 years and after they were going to come out with great substance, see, and for this to happen, they had to get into Egypt. So no, under this condition, they could have prayed, give us this day our daily bread, and their fields would never have grown. Because that wasn't God's purpose to stay in Canaan at that time. For them to become a mighty nation, they had to do it outside of Canaan. And they did. To preserve life, ultimately it was to preserve their lives for the coming of the seed of Abraham. To keep this race alive was critical because God was going to give to this race a son. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Huh? The government should be upon his shoulders. See? So he had to preserve this people. He wasn't going to give the son to the Romans or to the Egyptians or to the Mediterraneans. So he had to keep them alive for this. So God just couldn't sustain his people through normal means. And he can't today either. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? It isn't that he couldn't. Mm -hmm. It's that he will not. Why? Because then his glory wouldn't be seen. Yeah. Then he wouldn't get credit. Yeah. Uh -huh. See, if all of a sudden their fields grew, then like uh, the Philistines envied Isaac. Remember when he had, he had these bumper crops? They envied him. They didn't say, look what the Lord has done. See, they didn't see that. But this has worked out so we can look back hundreds of years later and say, look what God did. Yeah, amen. And he gets amen. glory. See? Yeah. Yes, Brother Aaron. It's amazing to me how, how godly Joseph is, uh, considering his time. He's think, he reasons on these things godly, yeah. in a yeah. godly way. Uh, he behaves himself in Potiphar's house and in the jail and in Pharaoh's house in godly manners. And now he's dealing with his brethren in a godly manner as well. And it... In, in some very particular ways, he his dealings with his brothers before he made himself known was in godly ways. He blessed them, yeah. and he found yeah. out. You know, he he, lined, he sat him down at the table, and you know, in, in birth order and things. He returned his returned their money to him, and all these things. That, see, there's a lot of working going on even before a person realizes Amen. that this is this is the Lord, uh, Amen. and then in his in his uh, revealing of himself, it's it's very very godly ways to to do things. I remember Brother Fred saying a person ought to feel as guilty as they should, yes. and he and he did. He made he he made him feel guilty and he comforted him. Amen. And that's that's a godly that's a godly manner. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's wonderful to ponder.
I can guarantee you that if you will, if you will look back to when you came into Christ, mm -hmm. you will be able to identify specific people that were connected with your entrance into Christ. Yeah. Where God sent them to you, see, mm -hmm. God gave to every man, ministers like God gave to every man. Mm -hmm. So here you have it depicted in Joseph at very early times. This is worked out so now you can read his record through the eyes illuminated eyes and you can see oh I, yeah I see how God did this and God did that now of course he is a, a detailed type of Christ as a man Jesus was the most favorite of his father <laughs> he had betrayed by one of his own disciples he was delivered up to death by the people he came back from the dead. They had to face him again. He was exalted as head over all, and he's now distributing what is required to keep us alive. So see, it actually is a perfect, perfect parallel. Amen. Now we find we're able to kind of identify how much time it elapsed. He says, these two years had the famine been in the land. Mm -hmm. They were preceded by seven years of plenty. So he's been on a throne nine years at this seven years of plenty, two years of famine. See how he pinpoints? Mm -hmm. He was 30 years old when he came to the throne. Here's, here's nine years. So Joseph is 39 at this time. He was 17 when he left, so he's been gone 22 years. See, you can calculate all the... The, the, the time period is not, they don't make a point of the time period, mm -hmm. but you can see 22 years, the average person would have forgotten about the, yeah. everything connected with yeah. this, but he didn't. It's the principle woven throughout scripture that, that great stress is not placed upon periods of absence and sorrow. So the stress isn't, isn't placed on when no, J Joseph was oppressed at home and when he was oppressed in Egypt. The stress is in place there. The stress is when he's, after he's on the throne. That's the stress. You go back to Adam. He was, Seth was born he, when he was 130. We don't have any idea what happened to, for those 130 years after they were expelled from the garden. See, the stress wasn't put on that. Or the 800 years after, stress wasn't put on that. Abraham, for the first 75 years of his life, the stress was, isn't put on that. Isaac, the years from his birth until Abraham was commanded to offer him his burnt offering, the stress wasn't put on those years. And the years from that incident until he was 40 and married Rebecca, the stress wasn't put on that. And Jacob, the years from his birth until his encounter with Esau, they're not specified. 20 years he spent with Laban, the stress not put on that. Moses, 40 years on the back side of the desert, the stress wasn't put on that. And the 40 years he was in Egypt, the stress wasn't put on that. See, the point is that the emphasis is placed on the time that after the people come in contact with God. So when people give testimonies about what they were, it's questionable that this is right. If it is, just as brief mention, Paul said what he was, you know, a couple of sentences. Yeah, uh -huh. you, you didn't write a book about it. Uh -huh. The burden of what Paul said is about what he had received after he came into Christ. Amen. That must be the burden of our stress. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not on what we were or what happened to us or how we were treated yeah. or the experiences he went through. That is not where we want to place the stress. Yeah. We want to place the stress where God has blessed us. Uh -huh. It kind of seemed to be a principle of Scripture. And he says, <laughs> there's five years yet. See, he hadn't forgot this dream. Seven years of him. Five years. Five years yet remain. So we're going to have to do something about this. At the conclusion of the famine, then Joseph would be 44. Still relatively a young man. Now he says, God sent me before you. 22 years before you. <laughs> 22 years before you got here, I got here. Yeah. Took me took 22 years to get things ready for you to come here. 
I had to be established myself so Pharaoh be inclined toward you when you came here. Yeah, yeah. Wanted to give you the best part of the land when you came here. God sent me. So the sending of Joseph, let's think how he, how he sent Joseph. What have, How did he send Joseph? Well, he gave him some dreams to prepare him when he was a boy. He gave him a preferred status with Jacob, his father. He, he used a traveling caravan of Ishmaelites. There were some Midianites among them that eventually sold Joseph. He, he, he used, this is how he sent, he sent him. This was all God sending, but this is how he sent him. And uh, Potiphar, the king's captain, he was instrumental by him. Potiphar's wife prepared him to go to prison. Prison people prepared to train Joseph further in responsibility. And Pharaoh, he used him to be irritated with a butler and baker and sent him to the prison where Joseph was so they'd, have bad dreams and tell Joseph about them, and he'd interpret them and establish Joseph as an interpreter of dreams. And Pharaoh's wise men, he used them to confirm that the answer wasn't in Egypt. Yeah, uh -huh. See, Joseph saw over and above all these things. All, these are just the details. And he summarized he, these details. God sent me. Amen. But this is how he did it. This is how he did it. Yeah. In other words, God adjusted the circumstances so that it hid what he was doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unless you had faith and knew God. Yeah. Then you could yeah. see it. But this is how God works. Mm -hmm. In that manner. To preserve a posterity in the earth. Mm -hmm. Jewish posterity. All of the brothers had to be preserved. Mm -hmm. They all had to be preserved. Because yeah. in the future, <clears throat> Moses and Aaron would come with the tribe of Levi. David would come from the tribe of Judah. A holy bad who helped with the tabernacle would come from the tribe of Dan. Bezaleel would come from the tribe of Judah. King Saul would come from the tribe of Benjamin. Anna the prophetess would come from the tribe of Asher. Apostle Paul would come from the tribe of Benjamin. Jesus would come from the tribe of Judah. Well, the point is that all these tribes had to be yeah. had to be preserved. Yeah. Because there are key people going to come from him in the genealogy uh, of Christ. The posterity of Jacob was critical to the development of a nation yeah. that would be an olive tree into which the Jew, G Gentiles would eventually be grafted. But it was important that God himself be seen and glorified in this. So Joseph saw it. God, God is, he didn't say... Well, God saw what you did, and he made it. He made it work out all right. No, that's, that's a too low of a view. Yeah, that's, right. that's too low of a view. Mm -hmm. God doesn't let men do it, and then he kind of shuffles it around and makes it turn out. God causes things Amen. to happen. Amen. To save your lives by a great deliverance. Now, I, this, I gather, was a prophecy of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. That was a great, great deliverance. He kept them alive until that, until that time. <clears throat> what can really be said about professed saved people that have no evidence of being saved? What, what can you really say about people like that? Doesn't the possibility of of God having a people with no evidence, doesn't that contradict the purpose of salvation, which is to glorify God? Uh -huh. Isn't it a contradiction of that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, people want to, they teach us to think this way. Mm -hmm. Well, they're God's people. They just made a few mistakes. No, we must insist mm -hmm. that the people bring forth fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Jesus did. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't bring forth fruit, mm -hmm. Father's going to remove you. That's right. That, and I don't think that that's being said as strongly as it, as it could. So now, he draws a conclusion. So now, it was not you that sent me, but God. And he had made me a father to Pharaoh. Now, the working of the Lord is like, like teared. 
Joseph is here talking at the highest level. The Almighty God, he purposes and causes and manages. That's We're talking about the same series of events, but yeah. then you've got the holy angels. Their sin is ministered, their interposed. And you've got Satan, who's under divine control. He's got that area where he's working that men don't have any influence in either one of these areas. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Men can't alter any either one of those areas, but it's God. Mm -hmm. Then there's the lower veil, vessel. Uh, level where men get involved there's some vessels for honor and some for dishonor yeah. that's the lower level uh -huh. now you want to reason to the lower level not start with the lower level and try and reason upward uh -huh. yeah. right. that's why people have a hard time with things like election and predestination yeah. and things like this they start at the low level and yeah. try and think upward and it, it, it doesn't work You've got to start up here and, mm -hmm. and reason downward. <coughs> the mighty God executes his will upon earth, and this is how he does it. He determines it. He manages it. He's overall. He, he calls into play holy angels, mm -hmm. cherubim, seraphim, archangels. The devil uses the devil. Then down on earth, there's things that happen on earth that are caused by these mm -hmm. two layers up here. When speaking of the sons of men, our attention is primarily drawn to what he has done on earth or what was or has been, is being done on behalf of men. That's how men tend to think. But we're to understand that all causes are ultimately traced back to God. We've got to start in our thinking. Our thinking has to start with God Amen. and end with yeah. God, yeah. both of them. When young Samuel, remember, received that word from the Lord, mm -hmm. of something he determined, a judgment he determined, judgment against Eli's house, he hesitated to tell Eli. And finally, Eli said, T you got to tell me. Mm -hmm. He told him, and Eli said, it's the Lord. Mm -hmm. he, he knew. Yeah. It's the Lord. He had no contention about it at all. Let me give you another example here. Job, after after he experienced all the, all these tragedies and the covering of his body with boil, he says, the Lord gave, uh -huh. the Lord hath taken away. But before he had the boils, the Lord hath gave and the Lord hath taken away. See, he, re he reasoned from the top yes. Amen. down. Uh -huh. Then he said, he taketh away and who can hinder him? See, he's, he saw, this is God. You gotta look at your life this way. If your life is you've had some tragedies and they've fallen apart, you gotta think you gotta, you gotta think this way. Mm -hmm. You gotta go back, start with God and come, yeah. come down from there. <coughs> One time David <coughs> was coming from Bagurim, and a man from the family of Saul, whose name was Shimei, came forth and cursed still as he came. He cast stones at David. And that all the servants of the king David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in mischief, because thou art a bloody man. This is to the king. Well, Abishai, a strong military man who's standing nearby, he said, why should this de dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. All right, now listen to what David said. And think about, think about now things that have really mm -hmm. been said against you. The king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? <laughs> David knew he was a bloody man. That's why the Lord wouldn't let him build the temple. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. He, traced, he started with God. Mm -hmm. Then he was able to handle it. Notwithstanding, because he knew it was wrong, he, uh -huh. he commissioned his son now about that Shimei. Mm. Make sure he doesn't leave the city. If he does, 
See, so he knew that eventually he'd have to pay, but not by not by David's hand because there was too much he said that was right. Yeah. Joseph is reasoning in this manner. It was not you, but God. Now this is an exposition of a statement made in Psalm 76.10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. How about that? Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath thou shalt restrain. Some other versions say even human rage will turn into your praise. I don't like that version. Human anger serves only to praise you. I don't... Human defiance only enhances your glory. For the fierceness of man praises you. Man's futile wrath will bring you glory. The idea is that man's wrath is not the end of the matter. In the end, God's going to get glory even for this wrath. Such is the wrath that was executed against Christ. God got glory out of that. He hath made me a father to Pharaoh. What's well, quite a sentence, isn't it? Yeah. I got that the meaning is that Joseph was like the beginning of a new life for, mm-hmm. for Pharaoh. There's a new way of thinking, new way of acting. Yeah. He like begat a new kind of a Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He had a wider range of understanding. Mm-hmm. His ways of governing changed the presence of Pharaoh. Of Joseph, as everything was turned over to him, it changed. Pharaoh thought differently. Mm-hmm. Pharaoh didn't shape Joseph's thinking. Uh-huh. Joseph shaped Pharaoh's thinking. Yeah, yeah, he was right. a father uh, to Jacob, uh, to Pharaoh. Now, you remember what said of Moses? God said to Moses that he would make him a god to Pharaoh. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. That means Moses would call the shots, mm-hmm. yeah. not Pharaoh. Yeah. And I'm the Lord of all his house. Think of now. There are some people God has given this kind of power to. They're not. It's not everybody. Mm-hmm. Let's take Jeremiah as an example. He's a noble example. Here's the God said to Jeremiah: See, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See. I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down to, and to destroy and to throw down and to build and plant. Whew. Some commission, huh? Mm-hmm. What tools is he going to use? Words. Yeah. Words. He's going to use words. He would make pronouncements to men and offer prayers to God and thereby shape the destiny of what was happening. <laughs> Markerable. See, the church, if it, if it will just wake up, if the church will just wake up and use its resources and pray to God, it can shape how things turn out. Amen. It can't, it, it, guys, God is not God's will just to expel evil now. But his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he can deliver us from evil. And he cannot lead us into temptation. Yeah. See, but the prayers need to go up. We, we, we have been made kings and priests yeah. Yeah. unto God. In Joseph's case, Pharaoh would receive what Pharaoh got from God came through Joseph. In the Pharaoh of Moses' day, what that Pharaoh got from God came through Moses. There are some people you know that if they're going to get anything, they're going to get it through you. Yeah, uh-huh. From God we're talking about. Yeah. Now the ultimate parallel, of course, is with Jesus himself. He humbled himself and passed through and returned from the gates of death, exalted to the right hand of God, and whatever we get now comes through him. Uh-huh. We can't get anything from God except through him. You can't get something from God through me. It's got to come from Christ through me. Yes, Judah? While you're bringing this out, when Jacob was with him, he recognized, I'm being blessed more than I ever have been because you're in Mm -hmm. my company and blessed of God. That's right. Mm -hmm. He saw it, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He was fickle. He didn't know how to handle it, but he he saw it. (laughs) He saw it. 
Now throughout the whole world and for all time, Jesus is the one who speaks and works for God. That's why there's no other religion that has the same God we have in Christ. View these realities as utter insanity to remain ignorant of Christ's words. See, this is utter insanity. Because this is how God works, through his words, through his works. Thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. Later we find that Pharaoh said this, but this is like a prophecy. You dwell in the land of Goshen. Goshen's in the northern part of Egypt. You're gonna, especially, it was the best. Pharaoh said it was the best of all the land, and it was conducive to their kind of living, which was agricultural. It was conducive to that. He didn't. He didn't. They sent him to a city. They weren't city people. <laughs> they weren't city people. So he sent him to Goshen. And there they could they could grow up in Goshen, their own in their own place in their own place they could grow. Yeah. It, it's still that way. It's still that way. You got to have your own place to grow. Yeah. What, what it is, it's in Christ. But uh -huh. you've got to have you got to have a special place to grow yeah. Yeah. and be sustained. Amen. For Jacob and his clan, it was Goshen. For us, it's in Christ Jesus and heavenly places. You'll dwell there. That's where you're going to stay. You'll be near me. You'll be near me. Now, it doesn't say exactly where Joseph and Pharaoh were located. People have concluded it was either Zoan or Memphis, which is kind of near Goshen. I personally think it was Zoan because the scriptures say that Pharaoh's counselors lived in Zoan. So I, that's where I figure... But see, it was close. It was the idea of the closeness to Goshen. You'd be close to me. And I'll, I'll keep you alive, but you, you're going to have to be close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Close to me. Now, he says to his brothers, haste ye. <laughs> that means hurry. Do it quickly, speedily, straightway. Uh -huh. There was to be no delay in what he's going to tell them, no hesitation. This was something that required accelerated response and activity hurriedly. This meant the task given to them would take precedence over everything else. But he now tells them it takes precedence over everything else. They may say, we'd like to just stay here and we could talk for a while. We finally got together. We understand each other. We could spend an hour. He says, you got to do this. What I want to tell you to do, you got to do it quickly. Go out to my father. Notice I call him my father. All, uh, up until this uh, occurrence, he called him your father. Now he's calling him my father. Go to my father. Say to him, Thus saith thy son, Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Go, go. Before, before Jacob will ever come, he's got to know my position here. He won't come if he just knows that I'm living here. That's not, that's not enough. That's not enough to induce him to come to Egypt just that I'm living here. Uh -huh. Tell him I'm ruling here. All right, now you've got to translate this into, into preaching. Yeah. People have to be told what Jesus, who Jesus is and yeah. what he is before they'll ever come to him. Yeah. A lot of people don't come to Christ because they don't know, they don't know he's exalted above all. Yeah. Some have heard that he's going to be exalted. Uh -huh. He's going to be king. He's going to come to earth and rule. Yeah. And that's just simply it's not enough reason to come to him. Yeah. But he is exalted. Tell my father. Make sure you tell him that. Do it immediately. Now make haste. Tell him this. Because he's not going to come unless he sees this. Then come down to me. I'm not going to go there. you got to come here. Yeah. He might say, he would say that where I am, there you may be also. See, so you, you've got to come where I am. I'm not going to come where you are. <clears throat> That's not God's will. we got to grow this nation. This nation's got to grow. It's not going to grow up in Canaan because Canaan's hostile. Not going to grow up there. Have to go here, and it's something that has to be done immediately. Now, this idea of immediacy, this is actually seen throughout uh, throughout scripture. When Jesus said, "Follow me," he yeah. didn't mean go home and think about it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he meant leave the nets and come here. Yeah, leave the right. table and come here. That's right. Get up and come now. 
Or he said, go and sell what thou hast. He, he meant to do it now. Uh -huh. Do it with haste. Let, let your light so shine before men. Do it now. Do it now. Do it. Make haste. Let your loins be girded about in your lights burning. Do it now. Do it now. It's me. calls for immediacy. Be yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord. Do, do it now. Don't wait. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. See, there's an order of immediacy in, in all of these things. <coughs> Put on the whole armor of God. See, it's, <coughs> it's a kind of thing you can't yeah. delay, delay to do it. <coughs> Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not, it's not something you plan on the calendar for the next month. Do it now. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, beloved, tells them what to put on. Immediacy. So this experience of Joseph, what I've attempted to do here, perhaps in a little clumsy manner, is to show that it reflected all the kinds of things with which we're familiar. God has revealed who he is and how he works to us in, in vivid detail. But when we grasp it, we can we can see, well, this has always been the way God's operated. Yes, amen. This has always been the way he's operated. And it, that's what edifies, you see, when you see this, because here was a man who believed it. So he profited from it. And you can't profit from it till you believe it. Well, I thank God for this... Uh, Rather tender moment, huh? Yes, amen. Made himself known to his brethren. There was a time when Jesus <coughs> made himself known to us. Yes. There was. Amen. The eyes of your understanding were opened up and you saw him for who he was and you couldn't you couldn't stop yourself. You you came. Yes. Uh -huh. Because of who he was and That's what right. he'd done, what amen. he said. That's why you came to him. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? This way, you said that he didn't send somebody back. Here he is in power. But you know, if if you're if you were in prison somewhere and you could get a message out, wouldn't you send for your yes. father to come and deliver you? Yes, but he didn't. He didn't do it. He was he was all about following the Lord and doing what he the Lord wanted him yes. to do. And it was almost as though he, in a sense, he had to forget about that the, 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 yes, what was going on before. He had to. Focus on serving God right where he was at. Amen. And this is a great advantage in Christ. You can do this. You can say, you know, a bunch of bad things may have happened, but you got to forget them. Yes, Let them right. go. And just serve God wherever you're at, whatever he's put in your hand. You just do it heartily for the Lord. And he'll bless it. Look. Amen. When Joseph was in prison now, he didn't become known as a leather, a leather worker. And made wallets <laughs> and stuff for people. Yeah, that's right. He was serving God. That's what he was doing. He was serving God. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible to grieve over your sins so much that you go out and hang yourself. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. possible to grieve too much. But we have been lifted out of the pit of sin. That's right. But what's good to remember is that the past is past, but that doesn't change the fact that it's there. That's right. We can remember the sin and be remorseful for it. But God, in His rich mercy, has brought us Amen. out of it, and you can't afford Amen. to get dragged Amen. down into it again. Amen. Be thankful we have forgiven. Amen. Yes. Anyone else tonight? So, something else. This uh, this is the matter that he they had to be the ones to go back and tell That's Father. Right. He didn't say, "Well, I'm going to go visit him and take care of." Us. They had to go back and say, "Joseph is in Egypt." <laughs> Now, uh, how that worked out for him, you know, yeah, the, the, all this, this, the, they had 22 years, they had to finally fess up to their father what had happened. Yeah. There was no escaping this. That's kind of like a little picture of the judgment. Yeah. You know, men are going to be brought to the face to face with what they've done. And, well, <laughs> we, we don't, I don't think we have any account of that, do we? Exactly the words of them, but they had to be the yeah. ones to do it. <laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record and for the revelation of yourself in it. We can see how that all things are of God, that you are the one who has reconciled us to yourself through Christ. We give thee thanks for it. We pray, Lord, for the ability to see what you have done, to place our focus upon it, and to put our emphasis on what we are in Christ Jesus, not what we were before we came. 
in Jesus' name, amen.